Hello YouTubers, I'm Zio, and I've had a lot of questions recently about particle physics, wave physics, time, travel, all these other things. Now, I wrote a book concerning metallic hydrogen, I called it Metallic Hydrogen Universe. Turns out, most of you don't read anymore. You get audiobooks and things like this, like the in-depth analysis, it isn't gone, you're still interested in the stuff, but you want to talk about it. So let's talk about the future. Let's talk about the present. Let's talk about energy for a few minutes. Energy, as we know it, appears to be an effect of one thing transferring energy to another, from another, from another. You've got like all these different energies, transverse energies. There's a dynamic binding point in the universe that allows us to exist. Some of the things that I'd like to talk to you about are the structure of photovoltaics on the, I guess you could call it a quantum level. Now if we look at the dynamics involved with a neutron based or a neutron containing material such as phosphorus, P37 was my introduction into photovoltaics and what they really meant on a quantum level. P37 all by itself is photovoltaic. That means when light hits it, it emits photoelectrons. Now let's look at why. In my research, now I'm going to be quoting a lot of my research because I did 25, almost 27 years of direct research into photonics. It, it never got boring and it was always related to lots of other things. So let's look for just a moment at what I believe the structure of a photon is. Photons, as I've been able to calculate so far, are disc shaped and they vary by energy density depending on their frequency. Now we know this already, but why? Okay, why do I say that, that photons are disc shaped? Well, like a coin that falls through the water, as it goes through the water, the coin itself transitions and flips. And as it flips from side to side, it begins traveling in a wave-like, sine wave-like fashion, down to the bottom of the pool. And depending on the density, or the thickness, you know, the total mass, of the coin and its diameter, this sine wave pattern is seen in the water. Now this is a pretty simple test to prove that photons as they travel through space-time are disc-shaped and to them they are traveling through a medium that is akin to a coin dropping through water. Well, what, oh, that just doesn't tell me enough, does it? Okay, a lot of you are probably gonna say that. Let's look at photovoltaics, because that's where I really saw the answer to this question. Why, why do photons do that? Why do coins do that? And why do they look just like photons? Well, let's, let's look at this for a second. So, let's look at a proton. A proton, you all familiar with a proton, right? Okay, a proton, We got down, up, up. Now, this is a standard model for the core configuration of a proton. However, I'll tell you, it is wrong in the sense that this is a kinetic force line, is when two protons are collided against each other, we end up with this configuration. So, the other proton, just before they collide, is over here in the back, we have up, down and in the front we have another up. So up, up, down. Okay, and that kinetic force line of course comes down through here and I'll do that. Anyways, so you have these two protons which are normally actually in a relaxed state like that. We have up, oh no sorry, down, up, up. In a natural configuration they form that. 
They're like, oh, well, that's still not disc shape, is it? Okay, let's not disc shape. Right, I get that, I get that. You know, but what it is, it allows us to extrapolate the following. Let's look at a neutron. A neutron is a proton. We have, now why are we making the middle bigger? Oh, why are we making the middle bigger? Okay, because the down quark has two times the mass of the two up quarks. Okay, so all things being relative, at that scale, the mass effectively is twice as much or takes up more space in uh, space. <laughs> they say, well, up quarks and down quarks are exactly the same. No, 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 uh, down quarks are twice as big there. They're two times as big. Now, the up quark carries a plus two thirds. Down quark carries a negative one third. Of course, we got another positive two thirds here for the up quark. Okay, and this is a proton. This is the, the un, you, you, you know, so you see the, the kind of thing behind it there, the unkinetic stress line, you know, where you took two protons and you collided them together. You got them perfectly aligned in the collider and you crash them together, but just before they hit, they do that. And then they blow up. That's why we have this distorted line. That's the triangulation, you know, we've been able to see it for a long time, but what did it look like just before they hit? What was the exact polar alignment just before they hit? And I guarantee you, they were just like this, two up quarks, two up quarks. And just as they hit, they have so much more energy opposing each other. They did this, they flipped around like that and then the two cores hit and they wrapped around and they went boom. So that's, that's a collided design. So uh, your triangular up, up, down is, is incorrect. That's only in particle colliders. In a natural state, they do this. They, they're just nice and lined up like this. So, well, we're going to go back to the coin question. Where we go, well, why do photons look like coins? Why do they look like coins? Why do they look like coins, Zio? Let's look at that. Well, okay, this is, this is a nice model here. It's a little bit out of range, but let's, let's just go ahead and uh, draw this little thing right here. Now, in a proton, we have this zone right here and this zone right here, which is an electron, which is used typically in orbit, and you don't have two, you just have one, but this is the zone that it goes in. Okay, now you wonder about that zone, and you start thinking about things like, well, I don't know, let's see, uh, we could go like that, let's see, I think it could go like this too. It could go like that. to basically create a frictionless surface for the electron. Now, of course, it's not just an electron. You have, you know, a cloud of electrons that surround the given proton. Now, that would be if you have a proton, but we're gonna, we're gonna talk about neutrons here, because neutrons is where, where we saw the secret. That's where we saw, where I saw the secret to, to photons, to light. Up here, above the poles of the proton, there is an electron holding cavity. And there is a waveguide that is comprised of minute vibrations that are both positive, or you could say positive, negative, equating to neutral. I call it a tri-neutral. field. Okay, in this funnel, I know I've drawn it really small here, its diameter, you may find photovoltaic material, I should say you do find that photovoltaic materials have a maximum wavelength of photons that they can absorb. And that's because of the diameter of that funnel. Now, where do you find this funnel? You find this funnel from a neutron Oh, well, how do you get a neutron? Sorry, let's just balance out the charges real quick. This one right here lends a half charge, negative. 
And there's another one down at the other end here that lends a half charge negative. There's an electron trapped at the poles above the up quarks, above and below in this case. And that's this little chamber right here is what I wanted to talk to you about. Photon energy coming in the top. Have you, ever, have you ever dropped one of those coins in one of those funnels and it goes round and round and round and round and round and drops in the bottom? Same thing. Photons fall into this waveguide. Photons of specific wavelengths because at photon level energies, you know, you got peak to peak. That's your wavelength. And that is, well, that's, that's your wavelength. So in, in this case, it's from visible light, where we got like 800 nanometers, down to UV, let's say, let's say 305 nanometers, and that's, you can see all the frequency. So that's, that's peak to peak visible light, visible, okay, wavelength. Anyways, so this waveguide takes photons and they fall down into this core. And this core down in the bottom has an electron. That's just an electron. Now, if you go deeper into particle physics, you'll find that electrons or negative charges can accept neutral charges and they add that charge or that mass to their own weight. But you need a cavity for that to happen. Now, the wavelength, now, okay, sorry. <laughs> Coins again, right? Okay, could it be a ball that fell into there? Sure, could be. I guess, but let's look into an unseen neutral mass. We, we, there's a bunch of things in the universe we can't see, and one of those things is dark matter. Yet, is this traveling through dark matter, or is this traveling through something that would be perceived or, or equate to neutral? Well, out in space we don't see a lot, so we're not really sure what it's traveling through. We just know that a coin-shaped object of varying densities travels in a wave-like manner through a viscous medium, in this case water as an example, water as an example, and this waveguide, I discussed this with a top scientist, double doctorate, German guy, very, very smart, DOE, DOD, what, 20 years ago, and he said I was right. Now, of course, I haven't gone out and really taught this because you know, I didn't need to. I didn't, I, I didn't see that humanity would be so busy texting each other and playing on Facebook to really realize the outcome of their actions. And in this case, they've wasted like the last 10 years. Okay, oh, well, I've wasted a little time too, obviously, because I never did this before. All right, so we've got tri-neutral field here guides the neutral photon into the trapped electron. Now what happens when this electron's charge exceeds the holding properties of the tri-neutral field? Now you say, tri oh, why is it tri-neutral? Because it's, it's comprised of vibrational energy from the positive up quark and the down quark. And how is that possible? How, how do the fields interact at the polar region? You know, they just do. <laughs> That's... Um, I, I can't see any reason why they wouldn't. Like in a magnetic field, there's probably flux lines that don't specifically interact. But if this were the case, then why would there be a cavity here? Well, that's, that's what traps the electron, is the up quarks cavity. Would you necessarily need negative from the down quark? Not if there was an electron trap there. That electron... It has its own minute vibrations and field dynamics which reinforce this funnel equating this funnel to neutral. So that's a neutral channel created by an up quark and an electron, which allows the collection of photons. Now, when the photon is absorbed by the, the electron, when the electron gets too big for that cavity, remember this thing, this thing probably is pulsating like that, bung, 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 or like that. Because this, this end, typically, on a photovoltaic material, is bound to an atom. Okay, it's, this is part of a nucleus. And this particular neutron, there's typically, it's like 4, 8, 16, 
points outward away from the nucleus. So this, this is occurring down at the nucleus level. And I've never seen any literature that shows this precise occurrence. But I know that this half charge electron and the strong binding force is holding this to the atom. Phosphorus and some of the other elements that are photovoltaic, you will see that they have a plus or minus on the oxidative charge. That plus or minus is these neutrons that face butt end out and interact with different things. In this case though, this photon is getting absorbed, converted to electron mass, and then the cavity, probably through vibrations that are created from the atom upward, it shoots it out that way as a photo electron and now it has it is a negative charge but yet this little electron is still held there just it got too big for the cavity and expelled a photo electron up here photo electron that photo electron is not expelled until the energy of the incoming neutral photons is great enough to expel it okay well, that means, in real terms here, now, 800 nanometers is considered low power. That's, that's like low power. 305 nanometers is high power. Now, why that is would have to be based upon this factor right here. Let's look at this as blue and this as near infrared okay center pole center pole as these travel through the the vicious medium of reality because light just happens to travel almost well basically at speed it, it sets the speed limit so it's traveling i guess against the push of time let's let's just look at that and differently for a little little bit here let's let's look at this wide Low energy, so low energy, well, let's look at low energy. That doesn't look low energy, that looks like a big giant thing. So, so let's say that in the case of near infrared, it's readily converted, near infrared, it's readily converted into frictional energy that instead of it being fat across the midsection, it's very, very thin and very, very wide. So as it travels through molecules, it has a much better chance. Let's, let's go ahead and draw one here. It has a much better chance of striking something. And it's so thin, it has such a low field strength that if it hits anything, it destroys it. Boom! And it blows it up and its energy is converted into vibrational energy or heat energy and it just steps on down through through the process of entropy the the point is is that the disk size will be greater but it will be much much thinner now if it could <laughs> if it traveled on the edge maybe it could go through some stuff but i think even then the blue or or let's go ahead and do like gamma i mean <laughs> gamma would gamma be closer to a ball maybe you know, we got gamma that could, gamma, gamma can go through 52 inches of silicon or six inches of lead. Blue, well, you know, it's visible light. This is gamma. Gamma. Near infrared. This tri-neutral field, though, it really defined what I knew about photovoltaics and how they work. And I designed some that that are pretty cool but recently somebody came to me with an idea that was ground shaking now that was 20 years ago 20 years ago when I when I came up with that concept right there and presented it to a double doctorate DOE DOD professor genius guy he threw me out of his house he was so pissed I wrote everything down on a piece of paper put it in his mailbox and two weeks later his daughter Frantically, according to my friends down at the uh, coffee shop near the uh, university there, frantically trying to find me 
And my friend's like, hey, dude, she's trying to find you. I'm like, okay, what does she want? You know, because I was just pissed. You know, I didn't like... The, the guy said that, that there was nothing smaller than a photon. And no, in, in this case, there is something here in this field created by the up quark that is many times smaller. It's so small, it's like... It's like comparing a ball bearing to a magnetic field and the electrons that hold that ball bearing in suspension or spin it in suspension, magnetic suspension. So the particles, which I call, they're, they're tri-neutral field particles. Or up quark field particles, you could say. Oh, we've never detected a tri-neutral field or an up quark field. Yes, you have. But it's not in the books, and you want people to stay stupid? Don't let them learn this stuff. That's just the way it's going to work. But I know they're there. I know that photons of varying diameters and densities travel through space and through matter like coins travel through water. You say travel through, well, yeah, like you drop one in a coin and you watch, yeah, it, it does exactly what I'm talking about. You should, you should go do that yourself. All right, so it's like, it's like Newton. It's like Newton and the apple. Well, it was, it was Zio and the, and the coin in the pool and he dropped it and it went, woo, it flipped over and as it flipped over, it traveled in a sine wave and went, holy crap. That's really interesting. But I didn't think anything of it at first. Later on, it came to me and I'm like, oh, that's just like a photon. Definitely. So recently, like in the last week, somebody came to me and they're like, hey man, I want you to look at this drawing that I've made. I'm like, all right, well, let's talk about that. He's like, oh, well, let's, let's think about that. And he came to me with a drawing and he says, hey, what's this? And I'm like, it's something trapped in, in, a, in a holder. Yeah, yeah, oh, let me do the rest of it. And he does this. He says, I've been having this dream, this vision in my head since I was a kid. And I've seen this thing. And here, let me finish drawing this thing for you. And he does this. And I'm like, holy crap, those are neutrons. I know exactly what those are. And what they've done here, whether or not this was handed down to them by the gods or or what, but to me, this looks like neutrons with using this field generated by the up quark. These neutrons here are being either held by an atom, I mean, larger atom, but it looks like it wouldn't be limited to just that. Or maybe I'm just reading into this something different, but to me, it looks like an electron trap that you could expose light to and make the electron in the, in the trap get bigger, like a lot bigger. According to what I know about neutrons, this could be the biggest thing in photovoltaics ever. A quantum light trap using tri-neutral fields and neutrons trapped either wagon wheel configuration you can make a pretty big trap I mean if you took your time hey we know how to move a proton around we can move protons around pretty good we can stack them up can we move an individual individual neutron maybe not but I bet there's an element that's like that damn big compared to that neutron that we can control, that we can make out of. And we can make sure that the, the polar alignment is possible so that we could create a cavity. Now, let's say we could. I think we can, but what would you do with that? Well, you're essentially going to, if you made like a tube, let's, let's just expand this concept out to a tube and we have a whole bunch of these. Oh, now we're gonna make the inside of the tube reflective. And now when we take a big lens here and we focus light down inside there and the light bounces around inside here, 
it's absorbed. Now, instead of these being straight in, what if we angle them a little tiny bit like this? Out this end would shoot photoelectrons. Continuous photoelectrons, probably close to, well, 100% conversion efficiency. Right there, 100% conversion efficiency. But it took, I mean, I don't know how long you'd have to make the two, of course. I don't know how many of these you'll need. And I'm not exactly sure what frequencies of light. Like, are you gonna have to use green? I mean, green is the one we use for, this, uh, our solar cells that we have right now are pretty much most sensitive to green. Who knows why? Anyways. Oh, that's right, oh, that's right, it's the funnel. I just told you why, were you even listening? All right, yeah, it's because of this. The funnel, the standard funnel on a, on a plus or minus oxidative state atom, and that funnel is a specific diameter. But we're gonna take that premise and we're gonna create a electron trap neutron pipe, essentially. And we are going to convert light at up to 100% efficiency. So if you put 1200 watts through the front end, you get 1200 watts out the back end, photoelectrons. Well, obviously out the back end, if you have an electron gun running at 1200 watts, you got a lot of power there. It's gonna be a little challenging to to probably collect. If it was me, I'd probably use electrospun carbon nanotubes and a mat. Mat. Okay, and what that's going to do is it's going to take in the electrons. Now, electrospun carbon nanotubes are like single walled carbon nanotubes, but they're all bonded together at every junction point. So it looks kind of like a scratch pad. And if you look real close at a scratch pad, a scotch bright pad, kind of like that, but perfect. Just like a combination between Buckminster Fuller's spheres and single wall carbon nanotube trees, I guess, where all the branches and stuff are all fused together in some crazy configuration. Electrospun carbon nanotube mats are not that difficult, and they are the future of power generation, not just in this configuration, but in batteries, in capacitors. Everything that we use relies upon electrical conductivity, thermal conductivity, and lightweight. I mean, come on, you could, you could do it, but they're still, they're still in the experimental phase. The Society of Vacuum Coders conference up in Washington, D.C. is filled with people that love to think about this stuff, but they're all focused on their own pet PhD projects and, you know, what they use to make money. I mean, obviously, they're not into making books about the future of everything here. I mean, this is, this book, I went into where metallic hydrogen comes from. In this book, I describe well, a whole bunch of stuff. But we'll go over the book some other time. Today, we're discussing how to make a 100% photo conversion device from photons, here, photons, woo, through this array, which of course, you know, you're probably gonna have to have a kilometer, so you uh, straighten it out as it goes through there, and or maybe you don't, maybe you want it to, to do that, you want it exactly, I don't know. Well, we'll have to build one and find out, but, the fact that we could do this based upon science that is hidden. Why would you hide this fact? I mean, this is straight up what we need. Come on, fusion? Psh, you can't do fusion. You can't do fusion here on Earth, and I can show you why. All the fusion projects that are currently in development right now, out there, other than you know weapons-based, uh, they're, they're talking, oh, continuous fusion. Continuous fusion. <laughs> Continuous fusion systems are a dream. They're a myth. They are a bean counter's fantasy. That's it. It's math without end. I can use math to befuddle any of you, but notice I'm not doing that. 
I did calculus successfully <laughs> when I was 12. They told me that I was going to go to MIT. They did. But I didn't. I decided to stay out in the world. So, look at all this stuff. I mean, this is just one concept. Basing what we see here, combined with what we see here, combined with some stupid diagram some guy showed me. And what my brain turned that diagram into is a waveguide conduit that converts light into photoelectrons. Continuous photoelectrons. I know, but that's just the way my brain works. You know, just like the, the sky dragon. I mean, if you haven't seen that video, you should probably watch that too. It's pretty cool. All right, well, this is a brief introduction into atomic structure, quantum structure, and the possibility or the reality that there is a serious gap in our knowledge. And we've got the materials, we've got up quarks, we've got up quarks all day long. We've got as many up quarks as we could ever need. But we're not researching this field effect, as far as I know. So, YouTubers, you tell me. Comment below, tell me what you think. You know, just kind of take it for face value that what you see on this board is correct. And I haven't seen anything to the contrary in any research journal, CRC handbook, <laughs> book of atomic physics. I mean, it, it, I can't find anything that shows anything to the contrary of what I just said on this board. It doesn't break any of the laws. I think it's very sound. But I think somebody needs to build it. Somebody needs to build a system like this pretty quick. Somebody needs to teach more about what's happening here. This is a simple, simple thing, but we're not going this direction. We're still going through what I call firecracker fusion growing pains or birthing pains. We have all of these researchers who have wasted our time and money based upon books that are incomplete. Metallic hydrogen is the path. That's what stars use. We don't have any here. We don't have any of it here. So we're basing our fusion systems on firecracker fusion kinetic dynamic calculations. That's it. We're like, well, if we take a gas and we compress it like this, yeah, you'll get fusion, but it'll be over like that. Now they're building a great big one over in France. Huh. And they say it's going to work. Huh. Yeah, they're probably going to end up with a big crater in the ground if they indeed succeed at initiating and sustaining firecracker fusion. It's not the same thing as controlled nuclear fusion like stars do it. I know how it's done. This book explains how it's done, but I don't think they read my book before they spent those billions of dollars on that facility. Of course, they started before my book came out, so in all fairness, they just probably need to read this and stop. Whoa, whoa, we're going the wrong way. Yeah, you know, and it would be kind of sadistic for somebody who's a lot smarter than any of them, like Einstein. Einstein was this smart. He was so smart. He was so much smarter than like just about anybody, ever. And he only told us a little tiny bit, a little tiny bit of what he knew, just a little bit. Why? To protect us from our own stupidity, from our own greed. This system right here, yeah. Make giant electrons pour out the end of a barrel. What does that make some of you think? Yeah, that could be bad. But in a controlled environment, it could be good too. So is it safer than nuclear fusion? Oh, you bet. You bet you're dealing with photons and electrons. You're not dealing with fused atoms that could blow themselves apart in, in mass. You know, they're talking about using seawater as a fuel. Why? We have enough problems with our oceans as it is. The oceans barely are surviving right now. There's huge swaths of the ocean that are dead today. And now you want to take that seawater and generate power for it when we have the largest, this big thing in the sky, this big sunshine thing that makes, look, sun, sun, sun. The sun's never gonna run out of power. We just need to figure out a better way to harness that power and convert it into something we can use. That's it. 
then we won't need fusion, you won't need fission, you won't need coal, you won't need any of these impractical pollution devices to generate power. All you'll need is the sun forever. And it, it'll be there forever. This process of conversion is not only possible, it's inevitable. An intelligent race will find this connection. An intelligent race will create a converter of this magnitude, of this order. And it will happen. Maybe not in your lifetime, but I think it can. I think we can actually build one of these things. But we're going to have to start at some point understanding that it's less magic and more practically applied science. Physics, particle physics. Anyways, my name's Zio. Hope you enjoy st enjoyed today's presentation. It's one of my first, so I'm kind of stumbling over my words here. This wasn't rehearsed. I just really love talking about this stuff. And when people hear me talk, they're like, wow, you should make videos about this stuff. You're really passionate about it. I am. I would love to just sit there and talk to you about this stuff all day. And through the magic of the internet, I can. Till next time, see you later.